What's going on, Imperials? If you somehow haven't seen the announcement trailers for the Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee games, then where have you been? What exactly are these games, and what does it mean for the future of the franchise? Let's take a look at what these games have to offer, both the good and the bad. So, here are the initial pros and cons for Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. Con number four, Go Connectivity. The fact that these games will connect with Pokemon Go is not inherently bad. In fact, it could be quite intriguing. I'm probably one of the few people who actually still play it sometimes. But for one, the game mechanics from Pokemon Go, namely the capture system, have carried over. To catch a Pokemon, you must simply hurl ball after ball. I'm not always a fan of this, especially when the Pokemon jump or slap away the ball. That part always makes me pretty upset. In Go, it can take up to 4 to 18 Pokeballs to even get a random Rattata, and that will add up pretty quickly at 200 bucks a pop. So I sincerely hope that they will not allow me to literally throw away my money if I can't get the angle just right. Can you imagine missing the Master Ball? Surely they wouldn't allow that. Also, it seems that transfers are only one way. I find this problematic because I don't really want to get rid of all of my best monsters from Go, since they're the ones that I use to win battles. And it takes a lot of effort to get some of those fully evolved forms, so I don't want to bring them over if all they're going to do is sit around and Go Park, as it's being called. We've had one-way transfers before in Pokemon for years now, but somehow Go being on the phone makes me think that going back and forth wouldn't be an issue the way that it is with Bank. And speaking of Bank, there's been no mention of being able to connect with that external storage system, which means that it's only Go Pokemon that are compatible with this game. Which makes sense, because I'm not sure how exactly the CP system will work against the standard level up process. There's not even a chance to gain standard experience in Go since there are no wild battles. Will you still need candy and that sort of thing? These are the questions that plague us for the time being, since we're stuck with knowing very little about these games that are a weird hybrid of two halves that don't really seem to mesh. We've been told of a sort of mystery gift that will be coming that has something to do with Go. It is promised to be a brand new Pokémon, which might be Zero Aura, but will almost certainly have its own movie at some point. But having a brand new Pokemon in the Kanto region could be intriguing. Hopefully they'll even give us more sneak peeks like they've done before with the likes of Togepi, Munchlax, Kecleon, and about half of the movies. Outside of the rather unlikely instance of a gaggle of new Pokemon, making these games nothing more than an extension of Go would only seem to limit its playability to me, especially into the future when the software is no longer supported. Pro number four, just look at it! These games look gorgeous! I've said before that the more classic games being redone in highly mastered 3D graphics would be wonderful and extremely well received by fans. It was so gratifying to see the locations that I've known for years to look so lifelike and new, and from a slightly different angle. Of course that's the opening of Mount Moon, what are you nuts? I know the Kanto region better than I do my state capitals. And the novelty of this new rendering will likely be enough to sustain the majority of the game, for me anyway. But hopefully there will be at least a bit more than just the standard story that we've done many times before. But even the characters and the monsters look amazing. The animation style seems to more resemble Generation 6, which I'm okay with since those games look pretty great too. Even simple battling will be a joy just to take in and absorb fully. And getting to know my new partner in such high resolution will be a grand pleasure. Getting into the Pokemon world in such a realistic way will undoubtedly make me feel the most like a Pokemon Master I've ever been, which is exactly why I sign up for this sort of thing. Con number three. Okay, is this a main series game or what? Because it seems like the people making it aren't even sure. Actually, the first question that some people had was whether or not this was Gen 8, 
to which we can conclusively say no. Yes, it's on a new system, however that's not always a solid indicator. Just look at the Mystery Dungeon series. It was the first Pokemon game out on the DS, but was still technically a part of Generation 3. These games are in a strange position of being both remakes and trying to have a Pokemon Go style RPG. But since it's kind of a remake, does that automatically give it special status? I don't think so. Its new style is what makes me think that it's not one of the core Pokemon games, no matter what the people in charge say. Pokemon are no strangers to side games, but the uniting factor that makes them side games is the fact that they don't play like the main series. They can connect to the other games, but the fact that there has been no mention of Bank makes me skeptical of even that possibility. Since it connects to Go and only Go, which is itself a side game, it leads me to believe the same of these new games, even if they are on the Switch, since anything that you might do, as of right now, would not be able to be transferred to a core game. Mostly, I have a hard time believing that they would implement all these features into a main game with no going back. I'll have to see several more games with these features in place before I would accept it as the norm, unless maybe this is the genesis of an entirely new series and we'll be getting Let's Go games every so often in the future. After the inevitable Kalos remakes, will we see a Let's Go Suicune? Maybe we'll finally get a Let's Go version of Delta Emerald. I will no doubt enjoy these games, but right now, it's kind of hard to wrap one's head around where it fits into the franchise. Pro number three, the Pokeball Plus. Now this is a very tentative placement, because it's not actually come out yet. But this additional apparatus looks quite interesting. The game is designed to be able to control with only one Joy-Con, so adding this extra device to do the same wouldn't detract from the game, and indeed it might make it easier depending on how your actual throws might affect captures. All that's required seems to be a means of selection, being the button on the top, and a means of locomotion, which is the joystick in the middle. It even seems to be a good size, so I dare say that carrying this item will help immerse me into the Pokémon world further than ever before. Especially when it glows in sync with the game, and even issues Pokémon cries after capture. Additionally, you can transfer a Pokémon into the Pokéball Plus and take it for a walk out in the real world. Now this has been done before, and truthfully I'd never really used the Pokéwalker, even though it came free with the game. I just wasn't into a Pokemon version of Tamagotchi, so I can't actually comment on the effectiveness of that device, but just the simple fact that that one did not appeal to me while this one does should be evidence enough. The same holds true with the Pokemon Go Plus wristband. I had no real interest in that accessory, because I didn't feel that it would enhance my gaming experience that much. And guess what? The Pokeball Plus can be a replacement for that wristband as well. We don't yet know the extent of rewards for using the Pokeball Plus, but whether it be experience or items, it will almost certainly always be adorable when you rub the Pokeball and hear the voice of your faithful companion, almost like they can leave the game and come with you into the real world. Con number two, the original 151. Generation 1 is undoubtedly solid in terms of Pokémon they created. There's a reason that Pokémon stood out from the crowd, and a big part of that has to be the designs of the monsters. All that being said, we have more now. Where's the harm in taking advantage of them? We've done the whole limited Kanto adventure in Fire Red and Leaf Green, and it was weird and problematic to say the least. And while they have added some Alolan forms, nothing else is new. So if they really wanted to breathe new life into the game, they could do something that's never been done in a Kanto-focused game and actually expand the decks. I might not mind this so much, except that we just went through it with Pokemon Go. It started with just the original roster, actually even less than that. And for some people that was a draw, but that's also probably why some people stopped playing the game. The whole premise behind these Let's Go games is pretty ingenious. To bridge the gap between the Go crowd and the standard Pokémon experience, 
in a ploy to get them in on Generation 8. But if their target is avid Go players, then they'll know that there's more than Generation 1. We're up to Gen 3 at this point. So unless that's all that they had time to model, I don't understand the reluctance. They might roll out patches to add more at some point, but again, we just went through this with Go. So I know that I wouldn't want to wait that long again. There are so many amazing Pokemon out there, it just seems like a real shame to not be able to utilize them all. There! Call me a Gen 1-er now! Pro number 2, Pokemon following you. Honestly, I don't know what people are going to talk about now, because Pokemon following you has been brought up non-stop since Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and now the feature has finally returned. Every Pokemon can once again come out of their ball to travel and play. But this time around is even better because different monsters have unique interactions with the feature. Gengar floats! Electrode rolls! They've even said that any Pokemon sufficiently large enough, you will automatically ride. You can just climb on top of an Onyx for a stroll. That is by far one of the best parts. When I saw it, I thought it must be some form of Pokeride, but that seems to be separate because they have confirmed that Pokeride is returning, meaning no terrible HMs in Kanto anymore. And something that I'm including along with this feature is your interaction with your partner Pokemon. They did admirably in yellow, but this looks like a real relationship that you get to build with your first Pokemon. They are always at your side, riding on your head or your shoulder, even when other Pokemon are out, they can stick around. We haven't seen anything about character customization yet, but we can dress up our Pokemon if we want. I probably won't utilize this feature, maybe just a simple bandana or something, but I've heard many people rave about just the simple possibilities and personalization. These Let's Go games have taken serious steps in expanding the ways that you can interact with your Pokemon on your journey. And that is just one of the reasons that they seem like they would be worth the investment. Con number one, hand-holding. We don't know very much about these games at this point, but they've released several minutes of early game footage and the results were not comforting. After Alola, people were ready to riot over the amount of tutorials in the game. Almost the entirety of Mele Mele Island is one giant tutorial level. So it's not that it's not expected, it's just disappointing. I have no doubt that there are new players for each game in the series, but the majority of people that buy these games are going to be players that have been doing it for a long time, and in fact most of their lives. They know how type matchups work! In the footage so far, we've seen the first gym and the guy at the front wouldn't let you in without a Pokemon that was super effective against Brock. That is absurd! Furthermore, in case you didn't plan on using one of those, they now have Pikachu learning Double Kick at a super low level. Do you know what Pikachu has never learned before? But they just had to give a fighting type move to your starter, lest you worry that they weren't good enough. And I'm willing to bet that the same is true of Eevee. One of the reasons that I liked Jolteon so much was that it was the only evolution that could learn that move, and be able to take on many of the rock and ground types it would otherwise be weak against. Now it just seems like everyone will be given something to take away one of their disadvantages. And when everyone's super... <laughs> no one will be. And what really takes the cake is your rival, if we can call it that. The first thing we see this guy do is hand you a bunch of potions. You can't be helpful! In Kanto we expect our rivals to be snobby and profoundly punchable. I don't know about you, but I instantly hated this kid when I saw him before I knew anything about him, because that's how I've been conditioned in Kanto. What should be one of the biggest obstacles in the game is now just another way for them to make sure it's not too hard just in case you rage quit and don't buy the next one. Pro number one, Coop. Wait a minute. Oh, Co-op. This is huge. 
Pokemon games have always tried to get people together in certain ways before, but it was always boiled down to everyone's own individual adventure. Try as we might, we could never convince the powers that be to let us try playing together with a friend, until now. Now it does actually make sense, due to Pokemon being exclusively on handheld systems, two-player mode would just be impractical. So maybe they were just waiting for the shift to a home console, but as soon as they could, it seems that they sprung at the chance. I don't know how it will work exactly, but there appears to be a drop-in, drop-out feature where a friend can pick it up with you at any point. Now, it doesn't seem that they have their own Pokémon, but rather take control of a part of your team. I suppose that turns everything into a double battle, and I would really like to know how that double capture system works, but I guess we'll see. But even if all of those features stink, it would still be amazingly fun because you get to do it together! You can finally have a true shared experience through a Pokémon game, just as if you had a companion of your very own on your travels. And this is yet another way of bringing in casual fans. If they don't have to commit to an entire playthrough, but can simply participate at their own leisure with their sibling or significant other, then they might enjoy it enough to actually consider getting Gen 8, once the trailer finally comes out and blows all of our minds. But of course, the biggest con of all is that I do not own a Switch. So, if you'll excuse me, what are your opinions on these Let's Go games? Let me know down in the comments. Also, be sure to leave a like, share this video, and subscribe so that you too can become an Imperial today. And we'll see you around next time!